happy May 1st, everybody. Um, this will be uh, quite, we've never done uh, expanded province-wide rounds virtually, so I guess this is a wonderful opportunity for the renal community to learn together uh, both how to do this and how to learn in the this COVID era, but also uh, to learn from each other and together uh, during this interesting time. So thank you all for making the time. I think we've never had such great participation at province-wide rounds, so uh, 65 or 66 people and counting. And this is truly a group effort from all of us to all of you. And this is the first of a two-part series, but what we're hoping is that over time, we won't just talk about COVID and kidney uh, care uh, in the province, but also talk about all the other things that are important to uh, people living with kidney disease and the care providers and how we're managing over time. So um, thank you all for joining. Next slide. So today we're going to talk about the overview of the current state and have a focus on home therapies and facility-based hemodialysis. And next Friday, we're going to give you an update on what we've done provincially in the world of uh, CKD or KCC clinics, transplantation and palliative care. And the purpose of this is really to answer your questions, but really to stimulate discussion and really foster collaboration at this rather unique time uh, in the history of uh, clinical care and the world. Next slide. Um, so everyone is affected uh, and we're really going to talk about why, what and how. The communities and families, our patients on and off dialysis, our patients with and waiting for transplants and um, healthcare professionals and all the staff working in and around healthcare the administrators, researchers, everyone. And so, you know, the life that we all signed up for is currently not what we're having. And so we're having all to adapt. The perfect, keep going, that's right. Oh, um, so the, what we want to do today is give you the current state of BC renal community structure and function, remind everyone how we're organized, give you the context of what we did with the Emergency Operations Center and other EOC structures, and then look at some key work that's been accomplished over the last month with some high-level overview of successes. Oh, that's right, keep going. You guys are anticipating me nicely, thank you. So you've seen this slide before, but you always see it in a positive time. And so I just thought it was really important that we sit and think about the structure that we have at BC Renal. We have um, five geographical health authorities. We have a number of different kinds of clinics that actually have adapted very nicely to the way that we're doing business. But we've always had the patients and community at the center, the regional health authorities around, and each of the um, HARPs, the Health Authority Renal Programs, working together collaboratively. And I think that structure has actually served us quite well in this pandemic time. Next slide. And you remember that we have a number of committees and what we did not have to do is we didn't have to reorganize anything. We simply pulled together those committees to address the issues that were facing us in this time. And so we maintained a, our focus on patient and staff safety and delivering care services without having to reinvent a whole bunch of other structures. And I think for that, we should be grateful. It allowed us to be nimble. It allowed us to get things done quickly. And it made us focus uh, as much as we could on all the things that needed to get done during the t a huge period of uncertainty. Next. So this is a picture of the uh, health emergency management of BC. This is one of multiple pieces, multiple um, structures that exist in the province's emergency management structure. And I do it there to highlight in the blue stars the fact that there is a planning section chief to whom David Byers, who, to whom we report a health systems operation. Keep, go back health systems, operations, people, public health operations and emergency management. And BC Renal touches all of them. And I think as we reflect on some of the challenges that we've had, it may be that some of the structure is more complex than it needs to be going forward. But ultimately, this is all designed to help the province um, move forward. Next. What we did with BC Renal is we have the medical directors of the geographical health authorities 
that exist within this context of all the other EOCs, provincial, regional, and institutional. And we all appreciate that that means that many of you and us have been at multiple, multiple meetings. We think that ultimately when you're trying to communicate, especially when you can't meet in person, maybe that redundancy is okay. But the purpose of the medical director's geographical, our little EOC, was to enable timely communication, to share in the decision-making in the context of a really quickly changing environment. And that was complemented by the work of our executive men, each of the provincial committees, the stats and methodology group, and PROMISE. And I think working together, we really achieved something quite different next. So, um, John Antonson, Melanie Brown, Mike Copeland, Marie Michaud, Anna Rag, and I originally met every single day at 5 p.m. for at least 75 minutes. And then as the world got a little bit slower, we were able to meet Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. But our responsibilities were clear. It was to make sure that we communicated with and between the institutions and regions, and that's no small feat because of the multitude of them really disseminate our key activities and try and identify issues and development and give each other feedback as people would come up with an idea in the morning because of a problem that came up and by the afternoon when they said it out loud their solution the group was actually able to say well actually maybe that wasn't such a great idea or had you thought of something different so we supported each other as well as the local groups and i think that that has served us well and we hope that you all feel like we were all always thinking about what you were doing at the cold face at the same time as what we were doing strategically and structurally next. So what we as a community have accomplished is we do have an organized cohesive set of plans and principles to care for our patients. I think we've managed to create safe environments for staff and patients. Uh, we have sets of documents for both public facing and for internal guidance. And we've actually also been able to organize some research activities that help us learn how best to care and manage patients in an iterative and dynamic fashion. We've all participated in thoughtful problem solving and collaborative and iterative planning, and we're learning about stuff we never knew. Mike Copeland can tell you more about cleaning solutions and PPEs than he ever thought he would need to know. Um, and so can all of you probably. Um, we actually have had multiple conversations with Handy Dart um, and the drivers directly. And John Antonson is best friends with somebody at BC Ferries now because we have notes saying that you can transport our patients um, by ferry if needed. And these are all things that we had to think about in terms of our complexity of the patients that we serve. We have a new vocabulary. None of us knew what an S bar was before two months ago. In fact, I'll remind you that the word COVID-19 didn't exist before March the 1st. Um, and so we, it's now parlance and the whole world knows what it means. EOC and EMCs are also new words for us, um, but we're all getting there together next. Um, if you actually look at all the documents that we've put together, you can go to the website and it's really quite impressive, um, the thoughtfulness and the professionalism with which the various documents have been created and there are a number of clinical resources, as I said, as well as uh, guidance documents next. And just some, uh, and they've been translated, many of them into multiple languages, which is also important and speaks to the, our dedicatedness to the patient facing world that we're so passionate about next. And just for some stats, uh, we actually uh, have out of the 36 original um, posts, we actually have reached 15,000 people on Facebook. There's been multiple clicks. We've had 24,000 impressions on Twitter. And um, we actually have, of the 19 documents, over 5,000 views of them. Um, so I think that's pretty impressive for documents that were made in quite, in a very dynamic and fluid situation. And I think it speaks again to the professionalism and commitment of everybody on all of those committees uh, and all the hard work that people have put in next. So we have a number of ongoing issues and they are issues. There is a ton of uncertainty and the changes have been erratic, not predictable, and people are making decisions on the fly, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and sometimes you know need to be reversed and we need to be living in a world where that kind of certainty or uncertainty is 
it, the, there is certainty of the uncertainty. Um, there is a lot of confusion with the health authority and institutional guidance and provincial guidance. Sometimes it's not as timely as we at the cold face would like it to be. There are some issues with discordance of what one health authority says and another health authority says, or what the provincial health office says and infectious control, infection control says. There is a not clear understanding of the difference between outpatient and inpatient guidance and recognition of where our patients sit in that weird place between in a hospital but in an outpatient facility and what rules apply to them. And I think many of you have been educating the administrators and others to try and understand that complexity. And we have special characteristics in these population, in our patient populations. There are huge challenges with self-isolation. Our patients rely on a lot of external supports and, and they have to interact with the healthcare system and team even when they're afraid. And to, it's hard enough to navigate our system in non-COVID times, but to actually continue to navigate it during COVID times and the complexity that it's all brought, I think are things that we are all thinking about going forward next. So today what we're going to do is we're going to review what has gone on in the world of home therapies and facility-based therapies and then actually have time for your questions and answers because what we appreciated is that whilst there are these groups that are doing um, amazing work and it is being disseminated, there's nothing like a conversation and a, for what it's worth, a face-to-face -face, uh, presentation like this so that we can actually hear your fears and thoughts and hear your comments um, and make it more accessible. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to, next slide, uh, Mike, <laughs> to uh, tell, <laughs> I had to remember the order, <clears throat> to actually um, go through the home dialysis. So thanks for listening and over to you. All right, thanks Adira. Um, so good morning everyone it's uh nice to be uh coming together as a community even though we're not all together um next slide uh so today i just wanted to talk a little bit about what we've done for our home chemo and then dr singh will talk about the pd side of things and what i'll try to cover i guess is a little bit about our philosophy of home therapies because i think when this all began and there was uh the very uh, uncertain times in the very early days of this. Uh, there was discussion about where home therapies, particularly hemo, uh, uh, fits and whether we should be redeploying the nursing staff to assist with surges or potential surges in the uh, hemodialysis uh, uh, population. And uh, happily, we did not do that. I think we really embraced the importance of home therapy. Um, and we really said now more than ever, getting people home uh, is an important thing. So then that brought up some of our challenges and that's what I'll talk a little bit about. How do we keep our units safe for both the staff and for the patients? How do we do the training? Uh, do we alter our training uh, uh, selection of patients and, and how we're doing it? Um, uh, what, what do we need to continue doing and what did we need to put on hold? And that was some of the tough decisions that uh, we all had to start to make. And then obviously a lot of concerns about supply chain. And then I'm just gonna, in the last moment or two, just talk about some of their unexpected consequences now, seven or eight weeks into this. Uh, next slide. So currently, um, uh, I want to really acknowledge the work of the HEMO uh, committee. Uh, uh, John is going to talk about timelines, um, but I think it's really important to say uh, the BC renal uh, programs generally had a large jump on this. Um, we were uh, at least a week, if not more, ahead of the curve. Uh, uh, looking back over my emails uh, in preparation for today, um, the, uh, there were emails going out about putting up the barriers and the protections for the units at least a week before there was a, a, a BC declaration of a state of emergency. And again, acknowledging the work that the HEMO committee did because they're really the ones that took the lead on this and then we, uh, we piggybacked on quite quickly because we felt they were uh, very much on the right track. I think that has put us in a really good um, position uh, globally um, and we, you know, we've had a very low frequency of chronic patients being infected and we've had no home hemo patients uh, to date that I'm aware of um, that have been affected by COVID-19. We do recognize that our home patients have the greatest risk of uh, uh, acquiring it through community transmission, um, but the perception at least that they're not having to come back and forth to the hospital I think has been quite a reassurance. 
And in the early days, we certainly spent a huge amount of time reassuring the patients that they were safe, uh, reassuring them uh, that the supply chain was intact, um, at least for the most part. And I'll come back and talk about some of the challenges that we've had there. Um, I think we found that our supplies largely have been quite robust, relatively speaking, for a small province in the world. Um, we've we've been uh, we've been able to, through a lot of work of a lot of people, keep things going for the home programs as well as others. Um, and a number of uh, communications had to go out um, uh, quickly to patients. Uh, trying to be open with them, trying to acknowledge that we were learning on the fly. Um, the uh, the uh, expression I've heard a lot is, uh, you know, we're, we're building the plane in mid-flight uh, as we're trying to learn what to be doing here and how to be problem solving things. But there have been differences for, from the suppliers, from the deliveries, as well as some of the policy changes that patients weren't used to. Next slide, please. So in terms of the procedures and processes, I think we've all quickly adopted a similar process to what's happening in the community, in the hemo units, uh, where patients were screened before physically coming into our units with the same questionnaire that we used everywhere else. Um, if patients were phoning in to come, we would pre-screen them over the phone and then re-screen them as they arrived in the units. Important that we did not stop any of our training activities, um, but if somebody came in with a positive screen question, then we would treat them under droplet precautions. We would uh, review them if they needed to have swabs done, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, this was really to keep uh, the units themselves uh, safe, a cold zone, so to speak, um, and, uh, and to be protecting the patients as a consequence of that. Largely, we followed the same approach of minimizing the number of uh, visitors. Uh, we did have to make some exceptions because some of the home hemo patients in particular rely on family members to do training with them. So if it was a situation where somebody needed uh, a, a family member uh, to be with them, then we would make exceptions, but we would certainly have very similar uh, restrictions as other programs. Next slide, please. Um, we did not ever stop training, uh, and in fact, uh, as I think both uh, Home Hemo and PD did, we felt initially that we had a two to three week window to really try to uh, hammer down and get as many people through as we could. Uh, so we actually tried to ramp things up uh, in terms of our training. Uh, fortunately, the surge that we were worried about has never come, but nonetheless, we, uh, we were certainly encouraging people to, to get into training, um, to acknowledge, PD is preferable over, hem over home hemo just because we can still get people trained through quickly. But if somebody was coming through for home hemo, we, uh, we did try to bring them in. In the early days, we certainly preferentially took in the patients that we perceived to be easier, quote unquote, trains, uh, younger patients, fewer barriers. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the decisions that was maybe a little bit of a harder decision to make was about some of the access issues. So if a patient came in training with a, a line, uh, but they had a fistula present, um, our traditional approach has been to have them do their dialysis training and their needling training and then go home. What we've done for now, and this will change as the situation evolves, uh, is that we've trained them on their line to get them home and then bring them back at a later date for, train, uh, for fistula training. And likewise, if somebody has a fistula, but um, they're having a hard time learning how to use the fistula, um, much as we did back in the early days of home hemo back in the early 2000s, uh, if the fistula was becoming a barrier to getting people home, then we would actually consider putting in a perm cath for those patients. We put that in as a recommendation. I don't know that it actually happened, um, but that's still in place if it's a barrier for discharge. Next uh, slide, please. Um, we have two machines, as we know, in BC. Our recommendation had been to preferentially use the next stage. Didn't mean that people couldn't opt to use the Baxter, um, but our rationale for preferentially using the next stage is that it is a bit quicker to train um, and uh, there are fewer home renovations needed to get people home. And we recognized uh, particular as the trades are becoming potentially less available, that would be a barrier for discharge. So um, preferentially uh, use the next stage. Again, as this evolves, we will come back onto the two machine uh, platform uh, by and large. Uh, next slide. Um, 
we have a, a very good travel plan for our home patients, particularly our next stage patients. Uh, that's a big selling point for our program. We've had to suspend that until further notice. And really that's in alignment with what uh, everyone else in the world is doing. Uh, included in that, we're recommending patients to stay in their primary residence and not moving to their secondary residences. And this is maybe a little bit controversial, but in, in keeping with what ministry is asking people to do, uh, these secondary residences tend to be in places that have fewer healthcare resources. So we want to protect the community. So that's why we're asking patients to stay at their primary home. Uh, next slide, please. Um, supply chain has been some challenges, uh, or we have had some challenges. I will certainly acknowledge uh, the work of many people um, uh, for this. Fresenius has really taken a, 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 a very good approach uh, and have been really working hard, but uh, Bill Kane, Sue Saunders, uh, Sarah Thomas, and Claire in particular, I want to acknowledge their work. They're meeting at least two or three times a week with Fresenius. Um, there have been no challenges in terms of our dialysis specific supplies such as dialyzers, bloodlines, and solutions. Um, uh, we have been challenged with uh, masks, gloves, hand sanitizers, and gowns. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what we did is that we had to make some decisions on that basis as to what were needed. If you recall, our CDUs and our home patients are all under a single contract for their supplies. Um, we felt quite early on that gowns and hand, sin hand sanitizers were not a priority for patients at home. Uh, we did spend time reviewing proper hand hygiene and soap, uh, soap and water washing for patients. Um, gloves, uh, we needed to forego the gloves at home, um, uh, largely because the CDUs were needing the, the gloves. And given that it was uh, different people being exposed to blood, uh, the CDU took priority. So with proper hand hygiene, we felt we could go without gloves for the home hemo patients. And masks is one that we've struggled with, but if somebody has no respiratory symptoms, um, we are uh, foregoing masks uh, for catheter hookups as well as fistulas. Um, uh, the patients do have a small supply of masks, but uh, it's been very, very hard to source the mask for them at this point in time. And that's in alignment with, with CDC uh, recommendations for the record. Next uh, slide. Um, the new realities um, in current times, uh, you know, we're minimizing our face-to-face -face contacts. We're still training. Uh, we're limiting our non-urgent tasks like routine access monitoring. And I put those non-urgent tasks obviously in quotation marks there. And where appropriate, we've uh, reduced our lab frequency over the next 12 months. And it's important, I think, for us all to acknowledge that we are looking at 12 plus months before we get back to our usual state of affairs. We're really looking at how we can enhance our virtual platforms. We're looking at how we can get back to some of these uh, uh, secondary things like access monitoring. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the current training plan we have certainly puts the risk of creating a big backlog later of needling uh, training. So we're trying to get back online with that. Uh, next slide. And the last thing I think I wanted to mention was um, the unexpected consequences. And there are both positives and negatives out of this. Um, the negatives certainly were the uh, limitations uh, uh, of having the family members not come in, a lot of anxiety uh, um, uh, about the PPE use change um, and the lab uh, change. Um, I put asterisks beside those because that also is potentially a, an opportunity in the future uh, to look at uh, if our differences are different with this relatively stable group of people and whether we need to be doing quite as frequent blood work, et cetera, et cetera. And we've also found price, price gouging uh, with contractors that were charging three or four times the usual amount to do renovations. So unfortunately, the bad side of humanity. The positive side, uh, virtual platform, particularly for remote patients, I think that's something we're excited about. Um, there has been a huge amount of collegiality across the spectrum, uh, and I think that's a positive that I've certainly found people just willing to put uh, agendas aside and get things done, and really been quite inspired by everyone about their, their commitment to keep people at home. Uh, next slide. Uh, and my last comment I'm going to make is that certainly the pandemic will feature prominently in our education uh, information about how valuable it is to keep people at home. We are going to be waving this flag for 20 years to come. So I thank you for that and I think I'll hand over to Dr. Singh next. Okay, um, good morning everybody. Uh, my camera on my very old laptop seems to come and go. So I'm not sure if to apologize for that or just to, um, uh, to save you from seeing how many times I touch my face. 
Um, but anyway, uh, what I'm just going to focus on is a little bit about the peritoneal dialysis response. And there are obviously a lot of similarities between the PD response and the um, hemodialysis response, a home hemodialysis response, as we worked very closely together. So just acknowledge that I'm speaking for the PD provincial community, um, as many people uh, have come together and worked on on trying to figure out uh, a way to move forward, not only within our province, but across the country with the Canadian Society of Nephrology. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanna, in addition to everybody who's worked on this, give a special thanks to Sue Saunders, who's the lead for both home hemodialysis and PD, um, as well as Linda Turnbull, Claire, and just locally within my own uh, unit to Mary Vanderhoek and Esther Lee, who um, go through a lot of the documents and Esther really makes them them work for us and she was quite instrumental at uh, getting this up and running at BGH for uh, virtual clinics. Next slide please. Um, so this was the state of PD before March 12th. Uh, I happened to sort of be on holiday on March 12th um, and then I came back and the world was different. Um, we have about uh, close to 900 patients on PD in the province and we're averaging about 34 new patients to PD across the province um, and the exits just the month before were at 29. So you can see that we we uh, weren't really gaining in numbers, but we're maintaining uh, about that uh, growth per month. And historically, um, about 80 to 90 percent of the prevalent patients were on cycler. And those who weren't on cycler, the vast majority of them were just new trains who were still transitioning to cycler. Um, training time averaged about 60 to 20 hours for CAPD with an additional 10 to 15 hours for cycler. And for most clinics, uh, the in-person visits were about four to six per year. And, um, I didn't put anything on the drop-ins because we really don't know how many drop-ins uh, we have per year. It's one of the metrics I think that um, we look at periodically but don't have a sustained collection for. And blood work frequency was about every one to two months in most places. Next slide, please. So uh, as of last uh, night, um, we only had one case of uh, documented COVID-19 in a PD patient. It happened to be a PD patient at BGH. Um, who had severe underlying CKD, um, obviously was community spread, he was still uh, working, um, and he was not on nurse next door, so there was no assisted PD, um, and he was admitted directly to the intensive care unit from the emergency department and died within 72 hours. Next slide, please. So the challenges initially posed to PD, similar to those posed to home hemodialysis, were how can we increase the capacity for PD at this time, recognizing that we might have a limited time frame to do that in case some of the nurses were um, uh, moved to other areas uh, of care. Um, yesterday on the CSN hemodialysis webinar um, in Quebec, for example, a home dialysis essentially stopped training anybody because a lot of those nurses had to go back to hemodialysis. The second challenge was how can we minimize patient and team face-to-face -face encounters, um, establish contingency plans for supply chain issues, um, and ensure safety and quality care with a potential decrease in human resources, meaning that um, our staff may decrease uh, even though patients were there and ready to start uh, home dialysis training. Next slide. Um, so in terms of increasing capacity, we had a telemeeting of the PD committee on March 16th, recognizing that 60 to 70 percent of the PD tubes in BC are placed at the bedside. Uh, so we already had a well-established uh, way of getting uh, PD access quite quickly, um, recognizing that this is not dependent on ORs or non-renal resources. So at that meeting, we tried to establish a number that we could increase, but pretty much um, as long as the, the um, Physicians and nurses who were involved in bedside PD catheter placement were still available. We had really um, quite unlimited capacity to increase our uh, peritoneal dialysis program. Um, and we could easily train up to two times the current numbers depending on staffing. And um, much to Mike's chagrin, I'm still working on this potential abbreviated uh, curriculum, which probably should already be in place, uh, but it's a work in progress. Next slide. So minimizing face-to-face -face interaction, um, well, for PD catheter insertion, you kind of need to be there. So that was one area we couldn't really adjust. But looking at what our sort of routine practices are, PD flushes or uh, intermittent PD, out, uh, PD, we were looking at what, what were the indications for that? Did we actually have any data on flushes? And I know many centers do it a, a lot of difficult, uh, a lot of those centers do it differently. So the question was, could we just take patients from PD catheter straight to train without these uh, intervening uh, steps? And I think uh, we ended up focusing that just on a case-for-case -case basis. 
For training, we decided that we would focus on CAPD only uh, because we could do this in a decreased time frame. Um, and uh, again, minimizing family where possible to household members, usually just one um, who could be there. Often we needed another family member for language barrier more than anything else. Um, clinic visits, we were looking at virtual visits for stable patients, um, looking at the patients who are on PD for three uh, greater than three months. And we looked at our drop-ins, uh, you know, things that we do to try to keep people out of the emergency or other areas of the hospital and assessing whether, um, you know, we could continue to do that uh, while also minimizing um, patients coming to our area. So we looked at iron infusions, transfusions, assessment for peritonitis or exit sites. With exit sites, I know a lot of programs were already, um, you know, uh, patients were taking pictures and sending it in, which wasn't exactly completely allowed uh, under current guidelines, but looking at some of those things and, and making them approved. Um, and then volume and blood pressure management. Uh, could we use remote technologies to kind of evaluate that? And one of the things that was uh, being rolled out in PD across uh, BC was the use of this um, cycler AMIA, which is a Baxter cycler, and ShareSearch, which is a remote monitoring and remote prescription management uh, technique. Next slide. So some of the routine procedures that we looked at were blood work. Um, and we've asked local programs to review this. We tried to decrease the frequency of the blood work to every two to three months for stable patients. And this is one area I think that will likely continue in the future. As we go back and retrospectively look at whether or not we were missing important information by having patients do blood work um, a little bit less frequency, uh, uh, frequently, I think that will be really important ongoing just to limit the amount of um, hassles we kind of put the patients through uh, and also our own time. Uh, one of the things that came up was transfer set changes. So PD patients routinely have transfer set changes done every six months. Um, and we said, well, that requires a patient to come in. Um, could we delay that? So we made an arbitrary decision to delay it to nine months. Um, maybe that will go on longer. We don't know. And when we looked at this data and actually asked the vendors about this, it was actually just based on the fact that the only study ever kind of done at that looked only at six months. It didn't evaluate whether six months was an ideal time, it actually just looked at safety data up until six months. Um, we put uh, adequest and pet testing on hold. In my world, I hope that goes on forever. Um, and then unfortunately, even though ShareSource could be one of the uh, remote monitoring techniques, it roll, its rollout had to be postponed because of the sheer number of people who would have to be in a room together to kind of get that uh, working. Next slide. So the documents that were created quickly, um, as Mike already alluded to, were uh, letters to patients for procedures are coming to PD, uh, planning for supply shortages, so instructions on the uses of masks and hand sanitizers and hand washing, um, planning for supply delivery. So uh, we had uh, regular meetings with the vendors about how they were going to ensure that their drivers, etc., were practicing uh, safe procedures. And uh, the response to this was that supplies were left at the inside uh, of the patient's home. So patients had to be responsible, patients and their families had to be responsible for sort of moving supplies within the house. Um, and then also, since we were having virtual clinics, we wanted to make sure that patients were prepared for that. So, um, you know, the patients who infrequently checked their blood pressure weight were instructed that they needed to do it for the few days before the clinic. Um, and for those who need to get lab work done, to have it done before the clinic, just to maximize the usefulness of that clinic. Next slide. Um, in terms of supply chain, I won't really go into it in much more detail because Mike has already uh, discussed it, but just a couple things uh, for home PD. Um, we prioritize patients who are receiving assisted PD, meaning the nurse next door, because a nurse who would potentially be going to other patients' homes was coming into a home. So we want to make sure that they had access to masks and gloves. And in situations where family members were assisting or being primarily responsible for the dialysis, uh, uh, in particular in uh, pediatrics or in uh, facilities where they were doing PD. Um, so masks were a major issue. Um, uh, patients were sent letters to give concrete recommendations about the usage. Um, and at one point, uh, Baxter did run out of supplies um, last week. And just to show how uh, novel approaches are being done, I think PHSA, through some work, actually sourced some masks for the higher risk patients, um, which Baxter uh, delivered. So there was uh, work and sharing of work back and forth. 
Um, as Mike mentioned about home hemo, there was no concern about PD supplies in terms of solutions, PD catheters, et cetera. Um, as we did discuss with Baxter quite early on that there may be a, a surge, so to speak, of PD patients going home. Next slide. Um, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Antonsen, uh, Mike, and uh, I and many other people uh, were collaborating with the CSN, looking at home dialysis and hemodialysis across the country. Um, there was a webinar on home dialysis on April 11th. And, and what we highlighted in that uh, webinar is that a lot of recommendations are based on expert opinion and, and review of the uh, ISN guidelines. And I think uh, one of the positive outcomes of this was that it highlighted areas where no data or future research strategies, very simple research, uh, could be evaluated and incorporated into the future, even when we can still see each other uh, face to face. Next slide. Um, a lot of controversy over the use of acute PD. Um, so the, the recommendations were, could we use uh, acute PD for AKI or um, to offload the hemodialysis unit for CKD patients who may be transitioning towards dialysis? Um, there was some discussion about the need for acute training or PD catheter insertion. Um, as of now, there is no Canadian consensus guidelines on methodology. Um, BC Renal was uh, ahead of the game in terms of having a, a document on the website uh, as a source for what programs require to introduce uh, PD catheter insertion programs. Of course, that was drafted during a time when um, we were uh, not uh, concerned about an infectious risk. Um, and I would just say my own personal opinion is that we didn't really want to have some way of training people to start a bedside catheter program uh, if they'd never done one because we didn't want to increase potential hospitalizations or um, concerns like that. But um, to try to advocate for patients to uh, for programs to make sure that they went to their hospital and said however they were currently getting PD catheters in to be able to keep that in place or ramp it up a little bit. Um, because of the uh, benefit of patients going home. Next slide. Um, so the PD curriculum, as I mentioned earlier, is still uh, up and going. So uh, in the future for patients, especially in remote areas, um, how could we minimize the amount of time that the patient actually had to spend at the hospital? So what were the essential tasks that needed to be taught and verified in person? And then what could we do sort of in a graduated way at home with patients, such as more theory on their volume and blood pressure management, um, nutritional classes, uh, helping patients to interpret their blood work, um, peritonitis prevention, which would be an ongoing thing, and then hand washing as well. Next slide. So I think initially in the first month, we, we had an approach of hurry up, and then we were waiting, and now we're kind of at the move on uh, stage. So I think what happens now is we reevaluate our norms, um, blood test frequency, use of some of the um, uh, uh, peritonitis screening, such as masks, hand sanitizer, um, and look to incorporate video visits regularly. Maybe we could eliminate some of the home visits that we all took so much time and effort to put in by having a video uh, home visit um, and using uh, training online. Uh, we use that for ourselves. We train online in many ways, so we could potentially use it for some patients. Um, and uh, some of the um, uh, unforeseen consequences of COVID is that we might actually meet the uh, Ministry of Health guideline for home dialysis in BC, which has been elusive up until now. Um, next slide. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much it for uh, peritoneal dialysis. Uh, thanks. I think we're moving on to uh, Dr. Antonsen and, and dialysis. There. I'm unmuted. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, John. Okay, thanks, Sunit. Um, uh, Sunit, I had a patient do IPD so that he could avoid having to do a perm calf hemo start as a bridge to peritoneal dialysis. So um, that was something that our team jumped up and did, which I think was great. Um, we have about 2,700 or 2,750 hemodialysis patients in the province. And uh, when the pandemic was coming, we had to think about what we were gonna do in the hemodialysis world to handle this. And I'll take you through a little bit of uh, what we did and where we're at. Uh, next slide. 
one of the rules of giving a presentation is to never apologize for a slide or have a busy slide. This is a busy slide, but I'm not going to apologize for it. This is a busy slide on purpose. And the point of this is to go back to the end of February, uh, beginning of March, and think about what life was like then. China was uh, coming out of their pandemic, and the, what sits in my mind were the pictures and stories we were hearing out of Italy of these terrible uh, death rates, crash on into hospitals, demands for healthcare services. And we were COVID naive in Canada at that point, and we didn't know what was going to come here. At the end of February, Bill Kane sent me an email. Uh, Bill is responsible for overseeing the, the BC Renal Emergency Preparedness Plan. And he sent me an email in, in February and said, uh, so what's the plan for COVID and hemodialysis? And I thought, huh, I don't know. I wonder what the plan should be for hemodialysis. And uh, as Adira said earlier, we have an existing structure that uh, did not need to be created or recreated. We just got to turn it on. And on uh, March 1st, uh, New York City had, or New York State had its first case. And on March 1st, uh, I sent an email around asking if we could fire up our already existing infection prevention and control working group for the hemodialysis programs around the province. And on March 4th, we had a meeting of uh, nephrologists, hemodialysis educators, medical microbiologists, infection prevention and control, and represent, representation from the BC CDC. We're on the phone talking about what is going on in hemodialysis and what risk are our patients at and what are we going to do. Um, that was fully uh, uh, more than a week, almost two weeks before British Columbia declared an emergency related to the COVID pandemic. In fact, before BC declared an emergency, we already had a posted guideline for how to manage COVID in a hemodialysis unit. And that you guys might be aware that. Uh, a uh, guideline has been uh, re-edited a couple of times over the last month, but uh, we got our units up and running uh, before the virus hit British Columbia. And uh, over the last month, we've had multiple meetings with Handy Dart and our, our tra patient transportation providers. Uh, we've implemented a, a common screening tool and are starting to collect data about what's happening with COVID in our hemodialysis environments. Uh, next slide, please. When we recognized that this was coming, uh, we quickly thought about uh, what are the issues, what are the, what's our philosophy, what are the concerns that we have. Um, this is Pat. She's one of my patients. Uh, I'm 55 years old. She started dialysis when she was 55, 30 years ago. And I thought of her when I was thinking about uh, speaking with you today because she is the prototypical person who is at risk from COVID. Uh, she's an older person. She is on in-center hemodialysis. She needs to come to hemodialysis three times a week. She doesn't really have a choice. If she gets the virus, she's at extremely high risk for uh, hospitalization and death. And uh, her case was running through my head or her situation was running through my head when we thought, when I was thinking about what are the things that we need to attend to. So in preparing for the COVID coming to the hemodialysis environment, we obviously thought about what we could do to prevent transmission of the virus between patients or between staff and patients. We thought about how to ensure the safety of patients and our staff, but we also thought about what can we do to make sure that the care we provide in the hemodialysis environment continues to be comprehensive and excellent like it always is, and how can we do that and not reduce or um, uh, denigrate the care that we provide. Uh, next slide. So we thought about our staff. We thought about what we could do to protect them. We thought about whether we had enough staff. We thought about what we should be doing with respect to screening, testing, and actually managing patients if they're positive or if we're worried about them having the virus. And that led to us uh, thinking we needed to have an actual guideline that would direct units what to do. We recognized early on that we might be having issues with respect to masks and gowns and gloves and that sort of thing. And another thing we thought about was, do we have enough machines? What if we get clobbered like Italy and we've got patients 
flooding out of the ICU, flooding into our COVID protective wards? Do we actually have enough machines and equipment to meet the needs of uh, patients on dialysis if we get if we get a big surge? And uh, early on, the the EOC, uh, the medical directors in Adira, we got together and surveyed every dialysis program in the province and looked at all the facilities, how many machines they had, how many portable water treatment plants we had, how many patients could we run in a hospital on any given day. And we realized quickly and thankfully that uh, mechan mechanical or technological capacity was not an issue. If we were going to have a problem in providing dialysis care, it was going to be with uh, having qualified staff to meet those needs. But uh, we, we recognize that we can ramp up the number of treatments provided per day in a hospital to quite a bit more than what we've been doing if it was necessary. So that was reassuring. We thought about who our stakeholders are. And of course, uh, our patients are in the center of everything that we think about and do. Um, but we also thought about the places that our patients touch, uh, other parts of the hospital. Um, we put in communication pathways with our local uh, medical health officers. And uh, as other folks have already alluded to, uh, we started thinking about transportation. And uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Next slide. So uh, March 4th, we had a meeting of our infection prevention control group for HEMO. By March 9th, we had a draft guideline. And by March 11th, it was posted. By March 16th, uh, it was implemented in, I think, every dialysis unit in the province. And that includes uh, meeting patients uh, before or as they arrive. Uh, to a unit with screening, uh, testing them, uh, swabbing them if they are symptomatic, putting a mask on them, and making sure that they have a place to have protected dialysis. We had to think about which units in the province could provide protected dialysis for a symptomatic patient and what to do for patients who might be sick in a place where they do not have protected dialysis uh, capability. So that was all part of our planning. We thought about uh, what we could do to keep the waiting rooms empty. And one of the strategies was to look at staggered starts. So instead of having 27 people arrive at eight o'clock in the morning for the morning shift, that maybe you'd have a few people arrive at 7.30 and a few more at 7.50 and a few more at 8.10. And not every unit has adopted staggered starts, but it's one of the strategies to reduce the number of people milling around waiting rooms. I think one of the challenges, and I'll speak to this in a little bit, is uh, the issue of uh, reducing visitors in, a dialysis, in the dialysis environment. Um, our patients, for the most part, have been very accepting of this. We sent around some written communication early on to let patients know that there were going to be changes in uh, how dialysis works. And so when we implemented restrictions on visitors in the hemodialysis units, they were mostly accepting of that. There have been a few hiccups where people are quite insistent that their loved ones come and sit with them, but uh, we've mostly been able to work through that. We put in uh, guidelines around physical distancing, not just for patients, but also for staff. And uh, we put in uh, recommendations around PPE. So you got a little picture of what my patients have to look at when I'm walking around. Uh, instead of seeing my mug, they see a mask and some goggles. And it's a little bit of a different environment. Uh, next slide. We've been quite uh, lucky and fortunate in British Columbia so far, uh, unless one of my uh, medical director colleagues tells me otherwise uh, today, we've only had six uh, chronic hemodialysis patients infected by COVID, uh, three in Fraser, two in uh, Vancouver Coastal, and one in the north. All of those patients contracted COVID by community spread. We've had zero transmission within our hemodialysis units. And uh, hopefully uh, the, re the elimination or the prevention of community or spread in our units is related to the things that we put in place early on. Uh, now we have to be fair to the world. Uh, the virus came a little later to British Columbia and uh, our spring break was a little later and our provincial health officer was on the horn early telling people to not travel. And so I think the, the small amount of, the relatively small amount of virus percolating around British Columbia has been a boon to our patients. I think it's important that we continue our, our vigorous efforts with respect to infection prevention control um, because we don't know uh, if we're gonna have another surge or when we're gonna have another surge and we need to be prepared for it. 
I've written down there, don't get cocky. We can't, we can't take credit for everything, but we have to keep doing what we can do. Uh, next slide. I wanted to uh, spend a minute or two speaking about transportation. Um, uh, Mike Copeland identified very early that uh, in, in these conversations that when we were in medical school or going through our training as healthcare providers, we never imagined that one of the things that we would have to do is be interested in what bus drivers wear and whether or not they should have a gown on and whether or not they need an N95 mask. What's an N95 mask? Who knew? Um, our hemodialysis patients, many of them travel to and from dialysis by public transportation. And our hemodialysis patients do not have a choice but to come for their dialysis treatments regularly. Uh, everybody else in the province was instructed to stay home, uh, only go out if necessary, keep their hands clean, don't let anybody cough on them, don't touch public surfaces, all of those kinds of things. But our hemodialysis patients don't have that uh, luxury. They have to get on a bus and come to the unit. We had meetings, telephone calls, webinars. Uh, we had a couple of uh, sessions where HandyDart and BC Transit drivers were able to ask us questions. And uh, out of nowhere, we built a relationship with public transit operators. Uh, and uh, I think we've uh, garnered a fair amount of uh, credit with them, which will help us in the future as we look uh, to organize transportation for our patients. Uh, next slide. Of course, there's challenges. Um, in no particular order, um, it it's, was a little bit easier to think about what we were gonna do in a hospital facility where we've got everything. We've got security, we've got porters, we've got all the PPE, we've got code teams. Um, our community units uh, around British Columbia are often uh, remote from the mothership at an in-center unit. They're not necessarily attached to a, a healthcare facility. Some of these are in strip malls. And so we had to work our way through um, whether or not we could provide droplet precaution dialysis. Um, is there adequate space? Are there isolation rooms in, in, hemo in community units? Um, there uh, was a bit of an issue with the supply chain uh, where all of a sudden the PPE delivery trucks said, we're not going into your unit. And they started dropping pallets of masks and gowns in, in the parking lot. And our nursing staff had to think about what they were gonna do to get those uh, supplies into the unit. We didn't see that coming. We're still working our way through uh, what to do with respect to cardiac arrest procedures in community dialysis facilities. Um, uh, this is another example of a uh, difference of uh, approach across the province. I think in Vancouver Coastal and most parts of the province, CPR is considered an aerosol generating uh, uh, procedure. And on Vancouver Island, it's not sure whether that's the truth. And uh, here on the island, we're told that we should only have protection uh, if for people who are COVID positive or suspected. And if they're not suspected, you don't have to worry about them. In Vancouver Coastal, everybody's COVID positive until proven otherwise. Um, do community dialysis facilities need to have N95 masks? They probably do if they're gonna uh, perform CPR, but what if they don't have N95 masks? What do we do in a cardiac arrest situation? So we're working our way through those uh, challenges in our community units. I've already spoken uh, to the visitor issues um, and transportation issues. I did want to make a, a comment about physical distancing in the unit. And I think as we have seen small numbers of cases across the province, especially small number of cases within the hemodialysis uh, patient population, that it becomes easy to let some creep into our physical distancing practice. We put masks and goggles on and we think that we're safe and it might become comfortable to sit next to a colleague or a coworker, um, And I think if we're going to prepare for the next surge that comes, hopefully uh, not, the, not a big one, but if it comes again, we need to remember to be vigilant with all of the uh, protection strategies that we put in place, including physical distancing between uh, uh, providers in our units. The final thing I wanted to speak about was uh, something that we recognized early on when the medical directors in Adir were meeting every day in uh, early and mid-March. Um, we, we quickly started talking about how things were different. Um, we don't have visitors in our units. We've got masks on our faces. We're not allowed to shake hands. We're not allowed to high five. Uh, our, we don't see each other smile. We don't see each other frown. There's uh, a lot of humanity, a lot of relationship, a lot of uh, family 
in a renal program and especially in a hemodialysis unit. And we are mindful that we can't lose that. We need to be extraordinary in our efforts to maintain and preserve the humanity that we bring to the care of our patients, especially when we're covered up with masks and goggles and we can't, and we can't uh, touch each other, and we can't have a hug. Um, there's also, in relation to the issue of humanity, um, moral pain or moral distress. Um, the staff and patients alike facing uh, the change in the new world here um, where uh, we might be faced with uh, not allowing something to happen, not letting someone's wife come and sit with them on dialysis and that that doesn't seem fair and we need to do it for the greater good, but um, it's hard. And I want us all to be aware of and remember um, that we're putting the patient in the middle of everything we're doing, um, but that sometimes in, a, in an environment like what's happening now, uh, there is distress. And I think acknowledging moral distress uh, is the, the lion's part of dealing with moral distress. And I think with that, I will stop talking about hemodialysis. And there's a few minutes at the end now, Adira, for uh, written and or verbal questions. Yeah, so, so thank you, um, all of you and the whole community for what you've done and for the three presenters. Um, I think that John has a great picture. This is actually in honor of Sunit and others, but mostly in honor of Bonnie Henry, who um, has been, as you said, very um, instrumental in perhaps the province's response. And yes, um, the dialysis group was ahead of it, but her, she, her living through SARS uh, probably informed a lot of her decision making, which may be uh, certainly a contribution to how well we're doing. There have been questions coming up um, as we go, and some of them have been answered um, online. But, you know, one of them was, you know, what have we learned? And I think to John's point just now, I think we've learned a lot about ourselves. We've learned a lot about how we as a community can work together so well. But I think the next challenge that all of the speakers have looked at and all of you in the programs um, have been dealing with is how do we go through the new normal? How do we actually manage um, in this new world where there are masks and goggles and changed ways of doing things. Um, and I think that's something that we should brainstorm and think about together because I think that, you know, as we've learned from the, our little BC renal M, uh, EOC is that our problem solving and our planning is much better when we do it together than apart. And so I guess if there's anything I've learned is the value of bouncing ideas off and not making decisions quickly. Um, so I think that that's one of the things, I don't know if there's another question. Um, as the reduction in transplant resulted in angst with dialysis patients and the increased use of dialysis resources. So the next week, uh, Jag will speak a little bit to the transplant, not a little bit, he will speak to the transplant changes. Um, I think that that's also been managed. The patients have all been contacted and spoken with that are near the top of the list. There has been a lot of communications. We have not yet seen an increase in hemodialysis, uh, although we heard yesterday on a call from Ontario that because of the reduction in transplant, reduction in home therapies in that province, they're looking at 110 percent um, an, an increase of 6% in their in-center dialysis and, and overcapacity. So I think we've done well to keep and preserve peritoneal dialysis and home therapies, uh, and we're starting back in into preemptive transplant. And I think if I can add as well, anecdotally at least, although I haven't seen the data, I've certainly heard from a number of programs that the, uh, the number of new hemo patients seems to be relatively constant uh, and consistent with what it was before, but there's been a substantial drop of the acutes because of the reduction of the surgical activities, uh, particularly in the hospitals that are surgically dependent. So it's actually uh, balanced out, if not actually not potentially even had a little bit reduction in activity at places like Bank of the General. I haven't seen the formal numbers on that, but that's certainly the impression that people are having. And I think I'm hearing that from around the province too. Great. And then there's another question. Early prevention seems to be crucial. How are we planning ahead for the possible waves while maintaining quality care? I think 
the everyone's outlined that you know we have to be vigilant while working out how best to optimally care for these patients obviously not ever seeing people and not ever touching them isn't the way that we're going to take great care of them but what is as Sunit pointed out, what do we need to do and what did we just get used to doing because it was a routine, but it wasn't a value add for the patient or their optimal outcome. So I think we're going to figure that out over the next little while. If the next surge comes, it will be in the fall. So it gives us a few months to figure things out. We do have the system set up. As we said, we've got the groups meeting on a regular basis. We've got data to look at. Um, so I think that, again, that's how we stay ahead of this and plan well any other there's adira there's a there's a question in there about testing and i think it also that also relates to what we're going to do with the next surge um it's amazing how time flies if we go back to the middle of march like literally five or six weeks ago um there was a lot of everyday change around who should be tested what are the what are the uh uh, symptoms that need to be tested for, what tests are available, how quick can you get a test result back. When the next surge comes uh, hope, uh, in the fall, as you said, Adira, uh, we are going to be at a different place with respect to testing. There may be serologic testing available. There may be more known about what the results of a serologic test uh, mean. We'll have a better handle on um, false negatives uh, from uh, nasal and or um, oral swabs. And you're right, we have a system already set up to, to deal with this, but then the next time we have to really turn it on, we're gonna be in an even better place to know uh, what to do and how to depend on uh, the testing uh, to track the disease through our, our communities. Right, right. I think that's that's right. And, um, and we're gonna keep talking to each other. And I think one of the goals is we used to have, um, province-wide rounds, um, you know, every couple of weeks around um, various general topics. We'll continue those, but I think we'll also uh, commit to reporting what each of the different committees is coming up with and what changes they've made in their usual care. So Sunit spoke about the curriculum, but when that's finalized, that's something to present. When, uh, you know, when we get the virtual platforms uh, and the variety of them that are valuable in different scenarios up and running and tested in a couple of things, we'll share that. Like, I think that's what, uh, what I think we've learned a lot is how to, how to best um, take advantage of the situation so we're in the best place possible um, next time. And for any other pandemic, I mean, if you listen to Bill Gates, the next one is a bioterrorism pandemic. Uh, <laughs> which is gonna hit us. Um, so he was right five years ago, so we might wanna listen to him a little bit more this time, but this is what this pandemic has taught us, is that there are ways to get at large populations um, through means and organisms, and so we need to be ever vigilant, and I think this is gonna be a new norm, not to be too negative, not to be too dramatic. Um, I'm just, there aren't any additional questions. We are exactly on eight, 32. I am really amazed. We had 91 participants at one point uh, right now and at one point there were um, 99 people besides the participants, besides the panelists that and the renal agency staff that helped put this on on the line. So I think that speaks to this. I'd encourage you all that if you have additional questions that weren't answered or anything, please send them to um, to the renal agency or you all have uh, our emails so you're certainly welcome to send them directly to us um, or to um, Sidoni who set this up and she'll forward them to us and we'll actually make sure that we answer them next week same time same place a different set of committees um, with uh, and then perhaps also if you have some preformed questions we might be able to answer them next week as well. So I want to thank the panelists, John, Mike, and Sunit, and of course all the teams and the communities that they represent, uh, and the renal agency staff that have helped to make this a really smooth, and all of you for making time to listen and to reflect, and then to hopefully um, use some of the things that you've heard. And so same time, uh, same place next week. Thanks again, and happy May 1st. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Wash your hands, don't touch your face. <laughs>
and all that stuff. <laughs> Bye, everybody.